Hello, everybody. Um, it's awesome to be at the Blender conference. I feel like I should say that every time I'm here, you guys are so cool, so much fun to be with, and so encouraging when it comes to developing and creativity and, and all this. And I always have just an awesome time when I'm here. So um, this is Amy Purdy dancing at the opening ceremony for the 2016 Paralympics with a rather large automotive robot. Um, and I'm doing that to build the suspense. I'm not actually going to tell you why I have this on the screen yet. So, And this is me. <laughs> I'm, I'm a simulation engineer for Gerber Technology. And Gerber Technology manufactures large tables for textile and uh, garment manufacturing. And I work with the software and support team. We're developing a 3D product and we're using it inside of Blender. So I, I primarily work on Python scripts for working with our garment design tools in 3D. Um, I love coffee, and I wish I had that mug. I actually created that effect in Blender. That's OpenGL with some reflection maps. And <laughs> My daughter, Hannah, was born on Saturday in Connecticut, and I left, the Blender confer or left Connecticut to come to the Blender conference. So I pretty much spent all of my husband credits to come here. I'll be earning those back. <laughs> so this is my older daughter, Elizabeth, holding Hannah when she was about five hours old. Uh, I still, I mentioned I'm mostly a Python developer. I occasionally get to do artwork. So this is a vehicle from a sci-fi series of novels. Um, this is the cover art for the same sci-fi series. I love modeling robots. I think Blender's primarily for modeling robots, from what I can tell. It doesn't work as well for me for organics. So the garment industry and the 3D print, or the, the, the process of creating garments inside of Blender took a really interesting turn when we partnered with Danit Peleg. So let me see if this video plays. Got audio. My name is Denit Peleg. I've just graduated from Shankar College of Design. I wanted to create a ready-to-wear collection printed entirely at home, using printers that anyone can get. I've spent the past year searching for the best solution. I worked with leading experts in the field, I guess that's enough. So, well, let's just pause this so that it doesn't start up again. I'll go to the next slide here. Gotta love technical difficulties. All right. So, um, Danette Peleg, basically she became famous overnight when she 3D printed a whole line of garments in her home with an army of maker bots. She's got like five of these 3D printers she had in her apartment in Tel Aviv. And she's using a couple of different materials. One is Filaflex, which is, it's a sort of re flexible rubber. It has about the same consistency as like car tire rubber. It's relatively stiff in most situations in most geometric structures. But with a printed structure that has a whole lot of sort of like leaf springs folding in on itself, um, like you see in uh, this sample up here, it's actually very flowy and very bouncy. You saw those models walking around. So the, uh, <clears throat> this garment that Amy Purdy wore for the uh, Paralympic ceremony was actually designed and created in Blender, and then it was sent to the 3D printers. And you can see there's, there's some of the stiffer structure stuff at the top, and there's some of the more flexible structure at the bottom. The uh, original design was a lot more complicated. 
we uh, had sleeves on there, and we had some different shoulders, and we experimented with a lot of different designs. There were several 14-hour work days where we just tried all kinds of different stuff, and we would send updates to the Olympic Committee, and they would say yes or no on different things. So this is the first design, and this was a concept we just did with an OpenGL render. Um, the first one that we actually printed and had the dancer try on had uh, it was much simpler than our original design, but it had a big, a really long section of this more stretchy fabric. Here's Amy trying it on, and here's the final dress with the stretchier version of the dress. There were, um, there were a lot of concerns with the, the movements of the ro robot, and let me, I'll get to that in just a second. So here's the final design. This is Amy Pretty posing in the photo shoot. And let me see if this video plays. Nope, apparently not. <laughs> Did anyone have a chance to see the opening ceremony for the Paralympics? Anybody view that? Hmm, apparently not. It was... Uh, it was actually seen by about three billion people, and not many people realized that that dress that was sort of a highlight of the whole ceremony was actually created entirely in Blender. So as we were... Let's go back a slide. If we can get it to go back. Oh, gotta love Google Slides. All right, so... We kept hearing back from the Olympics Committee with concerns, and they kept reiterating over and over again that this robot is not, the movements are not entirely choreographed. It's actually using an AI and a lot of sensors, and it's responding to the dancers' movements. So the software was a tiny bit unpredictable. They weren't sure exactly what it was going to do. And they kept saying if there's some kind of an error with the garment, like if part of it comes disconnected, or if it's too stretchy and it swings out and the robot misinterprets the movements or miscalculates the position of the dancer, the robot could make a sudden move. And this robot is powerful enough that it could easily lift a car, so they were, were really concerned that it could cause an injury or even death. So, you know, they kept saying, make sure the fit is exactly right, make sure it connects exactly in the right places, make sure nothing is going to come apart, make sure nothing is too stretchy, et cetera, et cetera, nothing can cons confine her movements, so, you know, or else she might be killed. So, no pressure, have fun. <laughs> In the process of creating this garment, um, when Dennett first showed up at Gerber, the person that she had previously been working with in Blender, their relationship fell through and she needed somebody new. She found out that I was sort of the resident Blender guy at my company, and so they introduced me. She immediately took over and said, all right, I want him to be working on this dress for the Olympics because I need somebody and the deadline is within a few days, and so I basically got pulled off of all of my projects and started working on this, which was surprising to everybody, or everybody including my supervisor, but they went with it. So it became apparent really quickly that in order to make sure the fit was correct and in order to make sure that everything was working properly and as antsy as they were about the robot being dangerous, I started coding just on the fly some tools to double check fit as we're transitioning back and forth between the 3D and the 2D versions. I created these measure tools, I created tools for flattening the garment and then converting it back to the 3D shape and just started laying down all of this code. Here's a close-up of the geometry there. I just I thought that was interesting, and a, a model um, trying it on for the first time. It's really kind of freaky geometry. I, I thought the dress was kind of crazy, but as a 3D printed garment, that's kind of what people expect, something that looks a little bit crazy and kind of weird. So they really loved it. And you can see the close-up of this stretchier fabric over here. Um, the same designer uses a couple of different materials, the Filaflex, which is the more flexible stuff, and then a, a more typical solid plastic, which she used for her line of shoes and for certain parts of other garments. So 
So this is the, the uh, under part of the garment. We actually had to divide it into small pieces so that it would fit into the printer, and this is just a cycles render of it. You, you can't really see it so much in the photos, but sh there was basically a one-piece swimsuit sort of a thing that had a lining in it that was underneath the, the gown part of the dress. Here's a close-up of this crazy geometry. And this is Danit's Instagram. This is the only proof on the internet that I had anything to do with the Olympic ceremony. You, um, you'll notice my right earlobe is very distinct, so you can tell that's me. And then this is the workspace, which is a tiny cubicle. And that was interesting because she's basically a celebrity. There were people wanting to interview her constantly. There were VIPs and various fashion companies and all kinds of people crammed in my, into my cubicle talking to her while I'm trying to get questions answered. We also had a dress form in there. We had as many as three different fashion people standing around a dress form, bending this weird 3D printed geometry around it and making comments about what I was modeling. And so it was, it was an interesting process and a really fun several days. But fortunately, the company took us out to lunch like every day while that was going on. So I got to eat a lot of fancy lunches and dinners. During the uh, process, we had a little bit of discussion about the fit and how to make an adjustment. And she started cutting pattern pieces out of paper and just grabbed one of my action figures and started dressing it. So this is basically a famous designer uh, dressing my zombie action figure in a paper dress. I just thought it was amusing, so I had to in include it. This is the same zombie action figure. After my supervisor dropped his favorite pen, my coworkers started putting together the paper garments, and a whole series of photos emerged of action figures torturing the pin in various ways, and there was a discussion about how much the pin was costing the company and employee time, and it's kind of an ongoing meme now. <laughs> um, at last year's conference, I showed a demo of a cloth engine built entirely in Python. So this is just a, a quick review of that. I wanted to show that with Python, you can actually do uh, big data operations. You can do some pretty heavy calculations in real time. So this is all running in NumPy. And the reason that we ended up using NumPy for this garment design or for the Olympics is because it allows us rapid prototyping. So, you know, you're, you're using the, the typical speed of developing in Python, which is higher level, and you also have the value of being able to do these really heavy calculations, which a lot of times we're working on geometry that was very dense. Sometimes we were using these STL files that were already subdivided. So in order to really do anything effectively, I had to code all this stuff in NumPy. So you could see that multiple cloth objects, just different pinning uh, configurations, are all being processed in real time. Um, this is just uh, another example of the same thing. Something I didn't get to show at last year's conference, we were experimenting with different bend spring models, and the cloth engine built into Blender doesn't have the ability to be very stiff with the bend springs. So um, I integrated this proxy object, which basically it's pulling all the data off the bend springs and the structural springs from this other object, and it's applying it in real time as the physics is processing it. Um, I continue to work on this cloth engine when I get a chance, but I keep getting pulled off and put on all these other crazy projects. So you can find more on this video on my YouTube channel if you're interested in it. Uh, you can also, for the Paralympics ceremony, it's really easy to find that video. Just Google Paralympic ceremony, watch it, keeping in mind that that dress was created entirely in Blender. I will probably start a thread on Blender Artist Forum for this cloth engine because I want to continue development. I've actually built a ray caster in NumPy that I've got working now for the collision. So. All right, so the entire process of modeling this garment, the way that we did it, we used 
our avatar tools, and we were emailed all of Amy Purdy's measurements, and uh, we plugged in the, the uh, measurements that we were given to our 3D avatar. And the way that that works is I've got about 2,000 lines of code that are measuring, well, actually analyzing the mesh, figuring out where the elbows and the arms, the head and the knees and the waist and all of the major body positions are. It will work on multiple avatars. I dropped in another avatar, analyzed it with my code, then scaled my rig in there, and it calibrates the rig so that you can type in like waist measurement or torso or um, any one of the measurements. It can be controlled with a slider, or you can uh, just type it in. And one of the difficult things about the process of setting up an avatar to be specific dimensions or uh, to, to get it the way that you want it by typing in these values is if you say, well, I want the inseam to be 36, and I want the torso to be 42, and I want the total height to be uh, 65. Well, sometimes those measurements don't add up to the total height. So I had to figure out, well, if you want to set the torso height and then you want to adjust the total height of the avatar, what do you do with the extra dimensions when you want to make the torso longer? Well, you have the option of propagating that change to the inseam. I've got lots of pose tools and various other things. Actually, the, one of the designers complained that when you put the arms together and you bend them, they intersect, which it's animation. Of course they're going to intersect. What, what do you expect it to do? So I wrote a collider for the hands so that now if you move the arms together, it detects collisions on the hands and it bends the elbows instead. So the hands will never intersect, and they were happy. <clears throat> All of this, again, is it's NumPy. It's, it's um, really fast, runs in real time, updates the avatar. There's this convex circumference measurements going on here where I generated a convex hole in NumPy. And actually, let me show you that tool. Five minutes. All right. That's just some under the hood, what the rig looks like. Um, this is a convex measure tool. It has options of uh, being either convex or contoured for measuring. You can slide it up and down. You can change the plane, plane angle. Works in real time. Let's skip that video. This is some of the different geometry that we created when we were experimenting. And this is how we had to flatten it to fit into the printer. I'm going to skip a lot of this content. Um, this is probably the crowning achievement of this whole process. I, I actually have tools that will allow us to extrude a garment just immediately. Instantly, we have a basic garment, forms over the top of the avatar with a convex hole. Then I can cut it and flatten it, so I ex immediately extrude a flat pattern. And then I can look at the distortion to figure out where we need to cut darts or seams. And then um, for the process of transitioning back and forth between the 2D and 3D shapes, I had to create a tool. The, the mesh deform modifier was supposed to do what I was trying to do here, but a lot of times it doesn't quite work. And we were working with two-dimensional surfaces for the most part. And a lot of times we had geometry that was outside of the range of the cage. So it just, I just found it really cumbersome to work with. So let me show you this tool that I created. And I finally got it working literally like uh, three days before the, I left for the conference. So I didn't really have a chance to do a whole lot with it. Um, I'll make this available to you guys. The code is relatively simple and easy to use. There's three buttons. So I just put a regular cloth modifier on a plane. And now I click my new tool to bind it to the surface. Bind to surface. I set it to update on all the frames. And when you run it again, all of this wacky geometry just follows it. And it doesn't care if you color outside the lines. It just needs a two-dimensional surface. And as you can see, it's not making a performance difference at all. <laughs> Obviously, applications for this tool with character modeling I, my mind was just going crazy. It's like, oh, you could so easily like, attach a shirt to a character, and then it would automatically follow the character. And I actually rendered some garments out with our 
Acumark software, put them on the avatar, use all the parametric tools, and the clothing follows the surface of the object perfectly. So this is just shrink-wrapped onto the arm. And then when I do this bind to surface, the mesh here is actually, it's like 50,000 polygons or something like that in this, this mesh. But you see it binds to the surface almost immediately. And it follows the character. I didn't have to screw around with the rigging or anything like that. So this is my new ma favorite modeling tool. <laughs> Um, with the same tool, I was able to render this bomber jacket. Uh, I flattened all the... Well, I, I extruded a garment around the character, which took a few seconds. I cut seams in it and flattened it, which took a few seconds. Then I got my tool working. I created all this crazy geometry and bound it to the surface and then turned the shape key back to the 3D, and all of that complex geometry just followed it. So once I got the tool working, it took me about 10 minutes to finish this jacket. And we've actually uh, created this rib structure and 3D printed it. And this is my daughter Elizabeth with Danette <laughs> trying on the bomber jacket, which is, she said it would probably sell for about $5,000. She mentioned some celebrities who might be interested in it. And so my daughter is trying on the uh, one-of-a-kind 3D printed prototype <laughs> bomber jacket. And uh, since I started working in primarily in women's apparel, everything starts to look like women's fashion. And I thought, you know, the Blender logo looks a lot like a high-heeled shoe. Oh, had to skip a couple. There we go. <laughs> and here's... <laughs> So um, my, my email address is up there at the top. Gerber occasionally hires um, consultants and full-time people. They're interested in people who work in Blender. So if you want to put your resume portfolio on file with us, or if you have questions for me, you want me to share some of this code, um, feel free to email me. It's right up there. Um, you can talk to me after the conference, of course. So thanks, everybody.